And we are live. Hello to the wonderful Laura Bauer. Hi, Mel. And I, I know Thank that we are so live. Thank you much for having me. Oh, well, you know what? Save the thanks till the end of the show and then see if you still want to thank me. Um, Perfect. But it's oh, great. It's great. It's it's great to be interviewing somebody I've actually met in the flesh. And uh, we were at a conference together last year in New York, SCBWI. You uh, flew in from Westchester and I flew in from Israel. And uh, <laughs> and you Not told quite me as far. You, you told me that you had a a book deal. Actually, you have a two book deal. Yep. And a year and three months have passed, and we're here to celebrate. So show hey, us your here. wonderful, it's your here. wonderful book, which is so beautifully named "The Imposter." Thank a few, you. A this few words the about the imposter. Okay. Yes, this is the imposter, and it was illustrated by the amazing Carissa Green. And Carissa did such a, I can't even tell you how amazing um, I felt when I saw the book for the first time because she just got it. And she just like nailed all the details and she is so detail oriented and professional. And I loved um, all the little funny, you know, humorous things that she put in. And she actually, she did like some amazing things I didn't even have in the text. So, for example, I don't have how um, Mr. Snuggles is found. I don't have that. And so she decided to interpret it, um, the dog. She puts a dog into the story, and then the dog finds Mr. Snuggles, which is such a fun detail at the schools when I go. The kids love seeing the dog come, and Mr. Snuggles is in the dog's mouth with the bow tie all ripped. So um, she's, yeah, she was amazing to work with. So, so we we have we have lots to talk about. Um, this uh, I I love this book. Um, uh, my granddaughter also had a, an imposter, a, a similar but different story, and I read it and I I chuckled all the way through. It's brilliant. It's your debut oh, you. picture book, and congratulations! It is really it is really I lovely. That. Um, so. You. Um, and, and and I've also had Sandra Sutter, the um, the owner and publisher of uh, Gnome Road, um, on the show. And um, I know uh, from personal experience that um, she chooses one manuscript in several thousand, and she's chosen two of yours. So kudos to you, Amazing. Laura. It, it is you. it is incredible. Thank you. Um, so um, tell us about your life and how you got into KidLit, and uh, then we'll start to talk about your journey uh, in finding this uh, wonderful publisher. Sure. So I started I started doing um, classes and taking writing seriously, I would say, in No, 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 Laura, no, hold on. We want to yeah. go back. You, I was born. I was born. Oh, all the way back. Yeah, yeah. I was born. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, I was born in on Long Island in New York, and um, I would say I've always been um, interested in writing and a writer. Um, I have stacks and stacks of diaries um, that actually my kids have just discovered and think it's hilarious about all the details that I thought were important in my life that I was writing down. So they give me a little bit of a hard time for that. But at, at, yeah, at, what, at what age did you have the diaries? I was probably seven through college. Yeah. So, um, and really my cl my closet is filled with them. So, um, yeah, so I've, I've been doing, um, and I still journal, like, it's just something that is just like a release for me. So, um, I still love doing that. Um, but yeah, I remember entering my first, um, poetry contest. I think I was in third grade and I entered my first poetry contest. And I remember I got an honorable mention, but it was like the best day and I was so happy. Um, but I, my love of rhyme, I think really started then. And The Imposter, my first book is not in rhyme, but I sort of, that's like the language I feel in my heart. Like I just, I think a lot of times in rhyme and I remember when I entered that contest, um, I was like, oh, this this could be, you know, this could be something you don't know at that time. I was only eight, but um, it was something that I just from then I remember just being like absolutely in love with um, writing. So in, in, I don't want to jump ahead. Actually, I do, because in 20 yeah. minutes, you're going to tell me that you started to write when your kids uh, were little, and you started reading books to them. 
Uh, but you know, yes. I have my I have my theory, Laura, and my theory okay. is that people who write for five year olds are five year olds. Are you a five year old? Uh, yeah, I think I'm definitely a kid at heart for sure. <laughs> like I, I don't know. I I teach at a preschool. I teach uh, two year olds, so I'm around them constantly, um, and I just think that you know it's it's a good way to. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, it's live. Um, I just think that's, you know, um, something I've always gravitated towards. I remember um, when I was a kid, I would be that, you know, child playing with my dollhouse and um, playing mom, and I would have my dolls. And um, it's something I always, I always wanted to have my own kids. And um, I, my jobs were always like centered around them. I was like but, a camp counselor. You, ah, okay, but you studied uh, something called. Uh management and leadership at college yeah, i was a leadership major at the university what, of what? richmond and laura what i know is leadership <laughs> how do you get a bachelor's degree in leadership yeah it's actually a very unique program i did that in communications but uh richmond's actually one of the few schools that have this leadership program and it was actually um amazing the courses that we took it was like um you study actually leaders in history you study current leaders you talk about the characteristics and traits that are necessary to become a good leader um, it was very hands-on a lot of projects that we we worked on really analyzing you know texts and then also analyzing real world situations so um, I actually I loved it I thought it was great and it was very unique um, but I yeah I did a dual major with communications too and then you worked in PR for 10 years I did yeah I worked at a um, a PR firm in the city for 10 years and I started also, out as an also, intern also, there. Also writing a copy? Yeah, I did. Yeah, a lot of press releases and byline articles and yeah, a lot of writing. Um, and I, I definitely, I represented some fun clients too. I represented the um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That was one of my clients. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but I also did, you know, I had office furniture manufacturers and I had um, a, a financial clients. So I had a, a huge gamut of clients, but um, I did get to work on some really fun projects and do some really fun writing, creative writing too. Okay. And then what happened? And then I had my first child, my oldest. Um, and then I was thinking about going back and um, it was a hard decision. But once I had her, um, I just decided I was going to stay home. Um, and then, yeah, what you said, I mean, with your first child, I was reading her picture book after picture book after picture book. You don't quite have the same amount of time to do that with your subsequent kids. Um, but for my oldest, it was because just, they, they, they're, they're, in, they're, in, they're imposters. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, they didn't quite get the same um, amount of reading, but they still got, they got plenty. But yeah, I would just read so, stacks so and Laura, stacks did, of books. Did, did, did you have a moment where you said, I can do this? Or was it something that built up from the time you were a kid? I think it was something that was building up. Um, and I remember, I don't know if you remember this, but there was, I was feeding my daughter um, at the time, a lot of Cheerios. So, and on the back of the Cheerios box, there was a spoonful of stories contest. And it was basically, you can write a manuscript, send it in, and then there will be a chance to be published. And that was like the first time I had ever heard about something like that, where someone, you know, just someone regular like me could like write a story. I mean, I really knew nothing about like the whole path to being an author. So that was like my first thing that I saw that I said, oh my gosh, like that is something that maybe I could do and try. I think I ended up not submitting or maybe I submitted, but I never heard back. But um, after that, it was like, I started to like work on stories a little bit when I had time, but um, I had my three kids so, so, pretty close so together. Laura, we could say that you're a serial writer. Oh. I'm a total serial writer. Yes. Sorry, I, I love had to, it. Yeah, go ahead. So you had your no, three I love, kids. No, I, I love kids too. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I have my three kids kind of close together. So there wasn't a ton of time. Um, so once my son, <clears throat> who's my baby, got to be um, two, and he was starting to go to a little bit more school, 
and I had like a couple hours to myself, um, that's when I really decided that, you know, I'm going to really work on this and focus on this. And so I started taking classes. I took my first class was in Westchester with Amalia Hoffman, the awesome author and ah, illustrator. Whom I've interviewed yeah. several times. Yeah. Hi, Amalia. Amazing. So that, Wonderful. yeah, that actually was so amazing to me and like such a breakthrough. Um, so the first class was at the um, local high school. But then the second class, she invited a group of writers into her house. And so I got to go to her house and she did the class from her house. And I just thought that was the most amazing thing. She had her artwork and her awesome books all around. And it was so inspiring. And uh, that really got me going. Okay. Yeah. And then what happened? Um, let's see. So that was 2016. And then I was definitely, I fell into the trap of like, you know, probably sending out my work before it was ready. Um, I, I worked on a bunch of stories, but, um, I didn't really have as many as you need to be, you know, polished and ready to send out. So I definitely did fell into that trap. Um, but, um, I kept plugging away. COVID was a little tough, um, just in terms of, you know, I, I, there was some, definitely some breaks in there with, you know, the kids all being home and having to be, you know, their teacher part-time and, you know, and make sure they're on all those, their Zooms. And so it was a little bit challenging, but, um. I would say um, I really like picked up after that and then I started to focus um, more on writing more and more stories that were ready. Obviously, I have the uh, critique groups, which have been so instrumental to getting my stories ready to go. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in 2020, um, I was submitting and um, then I connected with um, with Sandra actually at a SCBWI conference, um, Melissa Stoller, who you know, who introduced you and I, and she introduced me to Sandra. I call her the great connector. She's amazing. She just knows mm -hmm. so many people. Hi, um, Melissa. So she introduced me. Yeah, hi, Melissa. I call she her Mel, by me. the way. Okay. Well, that may, yeah, Mel and Mel. That's perfect. That could be a book. Yeah. It, it so, actually, I'm um, working on one. Oh, okay. We just it would tell spoiled her. everything. Okay. She's not, she's not the other male, but that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, she had introduced me to Sandra, um, at the conference. And then when Sandra opened up Gnome Road, um, I decided to submit to her and, um, yeah, so she then decided she was going to do, um, the imposter and then also my second book that I have coming out in September Emily snuck the world's smallest cook so um, I'm super you know grateful to her for believing in me and taking a chance on my stories her gnome Rhodes books are lovely Sandra is wonderful um, and um, I, I, I suggest that people go back and listen to our interview back in November uh, I don't always get to interview a, a publisher who you know owns her own publishing yeah. house, um, and she's incredible. And she accepts one in a thousand, one in a few thousand. Uh, she opens up briefly each year and gets a deluge of books, and she published two of yours. Yeah. So, um, yeah. and that, and that's without an agent. So we'll, we'll talk about agents in a minute. But you had a two book deal. Um, with a wonderful uh, publisher, small but wonderful. And um, how did it feel? Oh, um, I have to say, to for working on it for so long, so long, and just really trying, um, you know, my hand at this, um, it really, it it felt amazing. It really did. Um, Laura, just to I, I, know it, that it you didn't know, work. It didn't work that long. You know, some you people. Think? No, you started in 2016, and Seriously, you have a book but out. like that's, 2010 that's... is when I like started thinking about it. So that's ah that's okay. A amount of in that case, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. So so one what, what of the thing what, most American publishers, um, this isn't yes. the same in all places. Um, they dissociate the author usually from the um, illustration side so they might ask you uh, do you like the illustrator and you'll say yes or no and if they want to they'll, they'll pick the illustrator anyway um and you very rarely see the artwork um and you've given your baby for adoption and you just 
hoping you'll like it. What what happened with you? Did you see the illustrations? Uh, did you speak to the illustrator? Um, what happened here? Yes. So um, actually with uh, Sandra, she had um, sent over some potential illustrators, which I think is amazing to, as you said, so you don't always get the chance to see uh, potential artwork. So um, I definitely felt involved in the process from the beginning which was amazing. And so she sent over um, probably, you know, five or six um, illustrators and their different styles. And um, I just gravitated towards Carissa's work right away. Um, actually, it's funny, a lot of people um, have said, I've never met Carissa, we've gone back and forth on email, but a lot of people have said that this um, Olive, who's the main character, looks like my middle daughter, Stella. So, um, and Carissa has never seen my kids or anything, but um, it's just funny. It's just like, I really resonated with her artwork um, on so many levels. And so um, I was like thrilled that when she said yes, and um, yeah, she's just been like a absolute dream to work with. And then even afterwards, you know, she's, she shares her information and her files and um, and we've gone back and forth on email. I saw her briefly on a Zoom um, and I told her she doesn't live close by, but I said I wish she did because it would be really fun to do some events together. But did, did you see the pictures while it was happening or um, Sandra said, here, have a look at the art? Yeah, she sent me, um, so I saw her portfolio, but then she also sent me in the beginning, she sent me um, this whole like very professional character sketch. And so it was a character sketch of Olive and it was a character sketch of Mr. Snuggles and Mr. Huggles. And it was, it was awesome. It was just like, she had a couple different versions. Um, but the one that I saw was the one that she ended up going with in the book, which looks like these characters today. And I love the really cool thing about um, Mr. Snuggles that I love is that she made it an animal that wasn't, it's not clearly like one certain animal. It's not like a bear, it's not a puppy. She kind of made it nondescript because she said she really wanted kids to be able to relate to that stuffed animal and take their own personal experiences with their lovies and then relate to it by making it something that's not clearly one thing. So I thought that was really smart. And I love it, I love the animal, it's so cute. Oh, I have them here. I have the, the big versions. Yes, this is the time to show the actual <laughs> Mr. Snuggles and Mr. Huggles okay. in, in real life yes. for all the people watching. So I have the rest of you, the rest of you just Snuggles. run out and buy Laura's wonderful book. Oh, thanks. That's Mr. So Snuggles. Mr. Snuggles he's, the, he's the old one. He has a tattered bow tie and his nose yes. is worn and um, he's got the Band-Aid. Um, I felt a little crazy because I had to... Um, I was trying to make him look a little dirty. So I was outside with like a stick and some mud and like rubbing <laughs> in on a stuffed animal. If anyone walked by, it would be a little, little strange. But a little um, weird, anyway, yeah. it's Mr. Snuggle. Yeah, a little weird. And then this is uh, the imposter. So he's fluffier. The company I worked with, Budsies, was amazing. They um, put more stuffing in this one. And this one has less because when the lovies get worn, they um, start getting thinner and thinner. He has a fresh bow tie. And actually one thing that's been really cool to school visits, this is how much kids pay attention to detail. So in the book, one of the details is Mr. Snuggles has, and Mr. Huggles, they have a tiny perfect heart on its neck. That's right. And, yeah. I, and I don't have it. So um, I actually just ordered them um, and I'm gonna sew them on uh, this week because the kids are like, well, where's the heart? And I'm like, you're absolutely right. Should, they need to have a heart, so. I'm going to do that. I'm going to work on that. But um, Laura, yeah, now, are... now's, a, now's a perfect time to open the book and show us uh, some of the spreads and read us a, uh, because sure. I'm, I, I, I'm guessing that it's way under 500 words. The, the text is, is, um, is condensed yeah. and lyrical and lovely and funny. And the book is so heartwarming. Um, read us a little bit of it. Sure. And should I tell a little bit about it first or should I just go into... Do I don't think? know. I, you, what, what do you want to tell? Um, you know, your kids had their well, just, lovies and they lost them and they found them. Go ahead. Tell us. <laughs> the end. The end. No, just Olive is the main character in the story. And she has this very special stuffed animal, Mr. Snuggles, who's down here. Um, mm -hmm. And she loses him one day and she gets a replacement. One mysteriously appears. And that's um, the imposter who's all fresh and shiny and new. 
Um, and the book is definitely about Olive's journey um, to uh, accept the imposter in her life and, and open her heart and make room for more. Um, she eventually does find Mr. Snuggles, but she realizes that um, she wants them both in her life. So, and then, yeah, so this is just a little bit um, of the book. I love the end papers yeah. too. Read, read this. Oh, I do bit. too. <laughs> okay, sure. Yep. End papers are awesome. So there was one thing Olive loved more than anything else in the world. No, not Olive's, although they shared a name. Not the super duper looper or even Grandma Rose's costume box. It was Mr. Snuggles. Cuddly, reliable, perfect. Mr. Snuggles was an excellent game player, listened to all of Olive's stories, and always made her feel better. So when he this, went, this, meant. What's that, Laura? This is so he, perfect. This is so perfect. It, Mr. Snuggles. Cuddly, reliable, perfect. Uh, it's gorgeous. Like thank a page you. with, with, with six you. words and so poignant. Keep going, dear. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and always made her feel better. So when he went missing one day, ah, no, I can't go on. And we definitely have these moments at my house for sure. There was no time to waste. Olive searched all the usual spots, the pantry, her backpack and the bathtub. And no, then she hires Mr. she Snuggles. hires her brother. Hires right? her brother. <laughs> yep. Hires her brother. He's the detective and he finds everything she ever lost except Mr. Snuggle. So there's this big pile, so, which I'm so, sure so, a lot of people can relate so Laura, to. Uh, two, two questions now. This is gorgeous. I don't I, I don't want don't give Thank away you. too much. We want people to buy the book. Okay. Um okay. So, yeah. so, so two questions. Was there like a moment, a moment when you said, Oh, because we've all had this experience and, you know, very often it takes a, a really clever person like you to turn this into a, into a story. So was there a moment that you said, wow, this is a story. Uh, do you remember how it happened? Very often we don't remember how the idea came to be. Yeah, I think there was, it was like a culmination of things, but I do remember one thing that really stood out. We were, um, I was talking to one of my kids and um, they were just like ranking um, people or, you know, things in their life that they love the most. And they were doing like a rank order. And um, I looked at their list expecting like mom and dad to be right on top and their stuffed animal, number one slot, number one position, mom and dad, we were, we were somewhere on there, I think maybe four or five, but um, no, the stuffed animal was number one. And I was like, this is so powerful because to me and my kids and, and having this experience, they were absolutely 100% family members. They are part of our family. We take them everywhere. We shouldn't, which is why we lose them all the time, but they should stay in their beds, but they don't. They have to go on vacation with us. They have to go everywhere. Um, so Otherwise, they are, they're, they're going to have FOMO. Exactly. Exactly. They have to be there. Yeah, yeah. totally. So um, that's just, it was like all those moments. And then like when um, my dog one time ate um, my daughter's stuffed animal, and I really thought that the world might end for her. I mean, it was a moment. I'll just remember she was down on the ground like Olive and it was just, it was really, really powerful. And I'm like, wow, these, I mean, stuffed animals are so important to kids and what they can do for them, the comforting aspect, um, you know, it's just, it, it, it helps them. It really does like for bedtime, it helps them go to sleep. And it's just, um, you know, when they're scared or anxious or anything, it's just, a, it's just a comfort. So um, just seeing those things and um, how many times we've had to get the lovies back and do rescue missions all around town. So, so, um, so, so been... Laura, here, you know, like uh, I'm in Israel now, we're in the middle of a horrific war. Um, Sorry, I, I think I, sh I think I should have a Mr. Snuggles. Um, I think you need one. Yeah. Why? Why do? Why, why can't adults have a Mr. Snuggles? They can actually, and you know what's coming out about this book, which is funny. I've been hearing more and more from adults that they they're like, "Don't tell anyone," but I have one too. I think a lot of I think a lot of people do. I think a really? lot of adults do. I 
Yeah, I actually, I mean, my, my kids gave me a stuffed animal that I definitely, it's, I, I sometimes sleep with too. And they, you know, it was very sweet. They thought I really um, would want this stuffed animal and it's adorable because it's a bulldog and I love bulldogs. And, and so I, I have it. And I actually, I brought one, I brought the stuffed animal to college with me. So I was one of oy, the, yeah. <laughs> oy vey, oy vey, everybody. You had a stuffed animal in college. And you still got yeah. married and had a life and a family. And a, I did. That's, that's and I met my husband in, in college. So. Yeah, but does yeah. he know? I know. Does he know about the he stuffed did. animal? Where is the stuffed animal now? Um, Where is it now? It's actually, I bring it, to school. I bring it to school visits. It's in the house. I bring it to school visits because it's all like ripped and torn and stained. And it's not, it's not a, I don't sleep with it anymore. No, okay. this is too much information. But um, <laughs> this is from your childhood? A childhood wow. bear, bedtime bear. Yeah. Don't tell my daughter because she's mad at us now because um, we didn't we didn't save her her teddy oh. bear. I know. How I have terrible. heard stories like that too. I know. So and and, and, and yeah. in addition to to uh, the wonderful writing, there's something else, and I don't know whether this is to your credit, um, but the name of the book is brilliant. Oh, and, thank you. You know, how do you get a perfect title for a book that's two words long and the first word is the. So yeah. how did the how did, how did the how did the name come to you? The name actually just like popped into my head because we've had those situations where we have had to buy other stuffed animals that weren't the original when they were lost and the disdain that the kids looked at this thing with this the replacement with was unbelievable i mean and it just that word popped into my head it was like total like don't even bring this near me did, did, i don't did, want did, this did, yeah did, did, but did you get any friction um like did sandra say anything because imposter is not a word that kids use it's it's a word that adults use Totally, totally. Sandra didn't. She actually was on board from the beginning with it, but I did get pushed back in some of my critique groups. Um, they thought it was like too, as you said, like too adult of a word or um, not quite kid friendly. I had some awesome suggestions, but I just like, I just felt that I love when I'm writing to teach kids new words. And I do, I don't shy away from using bigger words in my manuscripts. Um, you know, this book, actually, if you look throughout the text, it does have some bigger words. And I think that's great because then kids latch onto it and then they start to learn, you know, through the context, what the word is about. Um, and in Emily Snuck, there are some bigger words too. So I definitely don't shy away from that. So I was really happy that Sandra was um, on board. Um, I've actually come to find out through my school visits, like when I've asked, I'm like, so who knows what, you know, what an imposter is and everyone's raising their hand. I'm like, wow, you know, these are K through two. This is amazing. But uh, there's apparently a video game um, among us where this is one of the, there's an imposter character. So oh. I think a lot of them know <laughs> that. Yeah. Cause they're all like, oh, he's a bad guy. And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, in my, in this book, it's not, it's not a bad guy, but a lot of them have that context already. So um, is interesting, but just hearing you know four year olds say the imposter that word is like super ador adorable. Um, and so, so I when I um, when I heard about the book and I hadn't read it yet, you know, you say the imposter, a picture book for, for yeah. four year olds, five year old kids. Right. Right. Oy ve, oy ve, right. What was she thinking? <laughs> but it, it's it's the perfect name and it's intriguing. And uh, together with the gorgeous cover, kids are going and parents are going to uh, want to buy this book. And also, it's so it's so poignant and, and true to life. Um, I don't want to Thank ask you. you about your your new book, uh, Emily Snook, the world's smallest cook. Um, yep. Unless you want to just share. Um, I mean, I, I applaud you on choosing Emily for the name of the ma main character, but just a few words. I know you. You have an Emily too in your book. And I said, oh, I I'm going to pick a name that nobody else is going to use, right? Yeah. Well, we talked <laughs> We talked about this in New York, right? Yeah, we did. We did. It's a good name. It is. So uh, just a few words about the book. Uh, we don't want to give it away. Sure. It comes out in the fall. Sure, yep. It comes out in September. And um, it's about a little cook named Emily Snook. And she enters an international cooking competition 
but she is much smaller and much younger than the rest of the contestants. And so it's about the big challenges she faces in that competition. And, and um, one of the things I love about it is that uh, her sous chef is her grandpa. And yeah. so he's kind of, he's with her and uh, he's supporting her and he's taught her what she knows and uh, they're, they're an awesome duo. So I love books like that. Thank you. And I'm uh, at the end, we're going to go and come back and I'll tell you my sad story of my book that I can't get right. The grandfather oh. and the grandson, maybe you can help me with it. Um, but I, I, I love these cooking books with the with the kids and the grandparents, and um, I can't wait to uh, can't wait to see that one. Um, so, no. um, you, you know what I'm going to ask you now? Nope. I'm going to ask you why such a talented girl like you doesn't have an agent. Oh, or, I'm or, working on it. So, I'm so working um, on it. Yeah, because I mean. It's, it should be a done deal with these uh, two books. Oh, thank you. It's hard. It's hard to get an agent. It's really, it, it's hard. There's a lot of talented, super talented people out there. It's competitive. So I'm predicting that you'll have an yeah. agent soon with your, with your talent. Oh, thanks, Mel. Thank you. Um, so, so you are trying that. to find an agent. You're not like one of those people who says uh, agents major. Yeah. No and you way. have lots, of, no and way. you have lots of other no. polished yes. manuscripts to pitch. Yes, so, now I do. Yes, so, so, yes, um, I have so lots you, of stories. Yeah. So, uh, so um, it's great to to be able to interview you, like at this at this milestone, this juncture. And um, there's nothing like having a the book in your hands and going to tell children about it and seeing it in stores. Uh, what is your advice? for the authors in the trenches who don't have traditional publishing deals, don't have agents, and uh, what what light can you shed on your process? On your sure. process? Yeah. Go ahead. Process, process, either one. Yeah. No, I'm looking for a better word, but I didn't find one yet. Uh, I feel like I have a lot. Oh, um, oh I see. Shoot. Um, yeah, I feel like, I feel like I have a lot of advice, but, um, one of the things I think, um, is to, uh, definitely, is this for people that are start just starting out? Cause it would be, my advice would be different, but if you're just starting out just to, you, um, you, you know, take, you, he, he, take one second, Laura, Laura, we don't, I, we don't know who's listening. Um, there are published authors okay. who are listening. There are, um, butchers who who uh who backed into their meat grinders um and got a little behind in their orders it's a terrible joke boy um there's all kinds of people listening we don't know who um is listening or watching right but among okay. the thousands right. of people so, listening and watching okay. are people um, who are on this trajectory yes and you, you can give advice to everyone right wanted. right um, yeah, uh, you can give advice to the butcher, you know, sure. be careful. Um, well, your... I... yeah. Be careful, the meat grinder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would definitely say um, invest in yourself. Um, you know, take the take the classes um, that you're able to take. Um, enter the contests that you're able to do. Kind of do any opportunity that you see. Um, take advantage of because there's so many connections and small moments that happen through, um, you know, some of the writing contests that I've done that I've connected with amazing people um, and the classes that I've taken, you know, the conferences that I went to just meeting awesome people like yourself and um, just being able to network and um, really open yourself up. Yeah. Yeah. Open yourself up to um, all the opportunities because um, there's a lot. I mean, this the writing industry is amazing. How many resources? It actually can be a little overwhelming, and you kind of have to pick and choose. But um, the breadth of like classes and the depth of classes that they have, um, 
and you know resources and things online and blogs and podcasts i mean it's such like an exciting industry to be part of but um and there's so much to take advantage of so definitely take advantage and um uh yeah keep i mean keep going it's just you know it's it can be very easy to get get frustrated um but i feel like believing in yourself like a little ted lasso and believing in yourself and um knowing that um like for me i you know definitely the rejections over the years was was really hard but at the end of the day like i love the writing aspect of it i love the writing element of it it makes me happy i carve out time every single day i teach in the morning and then i come home and i carve out as much time as i can can before i get my kids to do it because it it brings me joy um and makes me happy and i think those that can also make really powerful stories when you're writing, um, you know, those stories that only you can tell. Like, I feel like that happened with the imposter and other people, you know, you were saying it's universal, but I do feel like um, I had such a personal stake in that story and it flew out of me. I mean, my first draft, sometimes it's like, you know, crumpled up pieces of paper or deletions on the computer. Um, and it takes a while to get it down, but for this one, it absolutely flew Laura, out of me because I, I so, have so that you, personal you connection. That's something really important, okay? Um, it's 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 a very common, um, it's a common occurrence where kids lose their their teddy bears and stuff, and and his parents and grandparents yeah. are going to get them a uh, an imposter. Um, <laughs> but because of what you said right now. Because of your emotional investment in the story, you were able to carve yeah. out this sculpture as uniquely as you did. So you've taken a story. Many stories are things that you know that that are everyday stories, but then the author, you know, takes them into his his or her heart or their heart and turns them into something unique. And I think that's what you've done. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I feel like I, yeah, the personal connection to it, it just, it was a different process for me with the story because it, I wrote it just so much quicker. And in terms of the revisions, there wasn't like the major massive overhaul revisions that my stuff usually goes through. So, um, cause it was, you know, my story to tell for this one, like it happened to, to me and my kids. So it just came out a lot easier. There was revision. I'm not, I'm not going to say there wasn't revision, but it wasn't like the extensive revision. Uh, and um, you can almost tell when you read it. Um, we're uh, towards the end of our um, of our wonderful in, uh, conversation. Um, the one last thing I wanted to ask you is, so you, you had this Cheerio moment. You know, it's not only that yeah. you're saying to people enter contests. The, the the Cheerio box, which I think there's another story here. Yeah. Or waiting for you to write. Mm. You know, because when I was a kid, um, oh, we had tricks, and I don't know if we had Cheerios and all kinds of things, and, and there were sometimes surprises at the bottom, and uh, if you sent the the flap, you know, or the a reasonable facsimile, I don't know why they had that word. Like I knew what a facsimile meant when I was six because of the cereal boxes. <laughs> um, a reasonable one, a reasonable facsimile. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't know why that is, but um, I've never seen a, a story about like, um, you know, the, the, the magic inside the cereal box. Mm. And, yeah. and, you, and you had real magic in this, in this cereal story. Yeah. I'm going to venture... Yeah. And you might disagree with me, but I don't care that your story about Emily Stook, which I haven't even seen, somehow is connected to that um, primordial contest of yours mm -hmm. with the Cheerio box. You know, yeah. that she enters, she's young and she enters a contest. Right. It probably does. Everything's interrelated, right? And it's like lies yeah. in your subconscious. So maybe, yeah. So I can't maybe wait that for was... that one. I can't wait for that one to come out in the fall. And is there anything I haven't anything I haven't asked you? Um, I think we covered a lot. Uh, we covered a ton of stuff. I think so. This is great. I enjoy, I so enjoyed speaking with you, and I was so happy that we got to meet last year. And thank you yeah. for taking the time I, to have me. 
and, and look what happened. Uh, your magical book came out, and it really is a magical book. And um, I, I wish you lots of luck, and, and, and Sandra also for her uh, excellent choices. Um, and um, I'm going to probably yeah, yeah, end up interviewing more and more of her of her authors. Um, so uh, Laura Bauer, thank you very much. I, I had so much fun. I forgot to introduce the show. So I am Mel Rosenberg, and I'm the host of the children's, like 43 minutes into the show, I'm introducing <laughs> myself. I'm Mel Rosenberg, and I'm the host <laughs> of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. And I've been here with the wonderful Laura Bauer, celebrating her brand new, her debut picture book with Gnome Road Publishing, entitled The Imposter. And uh, everybody run out and buy this book. And Laura, um, we're going to leave and come back, and I'll just uh, share a few words with you and to say goodbye to everybody else. It's been okay. wonderful. Thank, thanks so much. Bye, everybody else. Bye. Thank you.